Chris Teitzel, with great power comes great responsibility. Chris is a third generation tech nerd, having used computers since before he was in school. He tried to escape the pull of his genes by obtaining a bachelor's degree in molecular biology. However, it didn't last long before he found himself pulled back into tech. Having been around computers his whole life and equipped with a background in science, he has a passion for using technology to better the lives of those he meets. Chris has been involved in an open source development for a number of years where he has focused on data privacy and security with the goal of demystifying proper data protection through encryption. This led him to create his latest company, Locker, where he is currently the founder and CEO. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah, so that's, that's actually one of my claim to fame. My grandpa started at IBM in the 50s. My dad thought he could get away. He became a science teacher. Two years later, he started at IBM. He's on his 37th year at IBM. I said, to hell with this. I'm going to become a doctor. And then I now am in technology. So um, at some point, I'll get an IBM employee ID just because I have to carry on the tradition. So, but today, we're going to talk about with great power comes great responsibility. And I still remember the day that my dad called me down to the garage and had a, a moving box for me. He opens up the moving box and I can still smell the smell of old paper in there. And inside was his comic collection from when he was a kid. And we're talking original Fantastic Fours and Spider-Man and Batman, Batman versus Spider-Man, which I didn't even know existed. Um, <laughs> But in the 60s and 70s, anything went, I guess. Um, and so as a kid, I grew up reading these. And then I, myself, got into X-Men and Spider-Man and, uh, and Superman. One of my favorites, actually, was the, the Death of Superman series. Um, and so growing up, I always had this concept of, like, what is a superhero? And, and how, are, how do these superheroes act? And, and why do we, as people, put superheroes on a pedestal? Um, I talked about this for a little bit, a little bit of background. I've been in Drupal for uh, nine years. I'm starting to make the conversion. It's not fully there yet, but in the last couple of years, I've been more and more in the WordPress community. Um, but I keynoted uh, Drupal Camp London this year and was talking about um, the idea of, of being superheroes as a way to empower developers. But as we, I went through the year, um, I started thinking more and more about um, the idea that if we're superheroes, we, it comes with a responsibility. So if you look at WordPress, uh, WordPress powers some massive brands, worldwide brands. Um, Star Wars, I mean, you run Star Wars. Your code is what makes Star Wars live on the internet. Um, but you also change the world. Your code is what's delivering powerful news to people every day of their lives. And so I came to this realization uh, in the last year or so that what we do to many people is pretty much the same thing as flying. Um, and I came to this realization as I was sitting in, in Istanbul. Um, I was on my way back and I decided to take a quick jaunt through Istanbul as one does uh, from Europe. And, and so I was by myself and I said, I'm going to go find a hookah bar and being a six foot one red headed pale white guy walking into an Istanbul, like locals only behind the Grand Bazaar hookah bar. Uh, obviously, I stood out. Um, quite a bit. And so they sat me down, uh, and pretty soon some folks came over and we started talking, and we sat there for hours, and we were smoking and drinking tea, and talking about politics and religion and life, and then they said, well, what do you do? And I go, oh, I make websites, and it's like, like this explosion went off their head, They're like, oh, I've always been wanting to make an e-commerce website, do you know how to make an e-commerce website? It's like, yeah, I can create one in a couple hours, actually. Like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. He's like, but hosting. He's like, hosting is really hard to do and I don't know how to do hosting. And I was like, no, I've got friends that run a hosting company that will always keep your website on no matter what. And it's just like, I came to this realization that me speaking about this, it's like, I was so, it was off the cuff. It's like, yeah, I know how to do WooCommerce. I can, I can build a, a quick store. But to people who don't know what we do, it is a very, very powerful thing. And it's the same thing as Superman Fly. And so, as I started to think about that, I started to think we have the same duty to use those powers to protect the people who don't have them as superheroes do. Um, and the reason why is because some men are looking for anything, or aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, uh, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. 
And unfortunately, we have those people in our community, outside of our community. And so we need to use the, the technology that we have, the power that we have with it, uh, to make the world a better place. And so Uncle Ben's famous line is, with great power comes great responsibility. And so that's the title of the talk today. Um, now I'm going to ask some questions, and I'm not going to really have all the answers. Um, I'm kind of taking you on my journey here. Um, so I hope that this kind of sparks conversation. There's a Q&A, like beanbags lounge back there. We'd love to, to talk more. Um, but I hope this is more of a, of a conversation starter than, you know, this is Chris's flag on the ground of what is ethics and what should you do, right? Um, and so I can't start a presentation about superheroes without introducing you to mine. So, my lovely wife, and my two kids. Sorry, I don't get an emotional effort. <laughs> wow, I've done this talk like three times, it's the first time I've cried. Um, but it makes me think, what type of web do I want to build for them? And this came to a realization uh, during this talk, WordCamp Europe, I'm crying now. Um, I'll tell you, this is the first talk that I've ever seen the Q&A. There was like tears. It was like a, a therapy session upon therapy session. So go watch this. Um, a lot of the talk today is, um, I like to say, you know, or the, the classic phrase is, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Morton's one of those giants in the community. So definitely go watch this. But the ability to create and the ability that we have in our code comes with the ability to manipulate. And we're seeing that a lot today. Um, so Facebook and Twitter uh, started to ban Alex Jones. And, they, and, and folks started screaming out, oh my gosh, like Twitter and Facebook are creating uh, what is and what isn't on the web, right? Um, Twitter got a little uh, delayed in their response to it, but they ended up getting on the, on the bandwagon and saying, no, Alex Jones isn't allowed on our, on our platform. And so as you're building platforms, you have the ability to dictate what is on them. Um, but nobody builds a Twitter expecting an Alex Jones. Nobody builds a Facebook expecting a Cambridge Analytica to appear. But they do. And you know, we've seen this in WordPress as well with the, the controversy around a lot of the Sandy Hook conspiracies that were hosted on WordPress.com. And um, normally WordPress.com and WordPress in general wants to have uh, you know, democratization of publishing. And anybody can have a voice. But what happens when that voice is destructive? And it's causing pain to others. And so WordPress.com updated their usage and their terms to basically say, you can't post the pictures of a minor without their permission, or without their parents' permission. And that allowed uh, them to go in and take down a lot of the Sandy Hook uh, conspiracies. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I recommend you don't. Uh, but really horrible, horrible things, and, and WordPress was able to, to take them off the web. Um, and this brings up the, the idea, and I'm going to butcher the Latin, if anybody's a Latin major or, or knows it, I, I apologize, but it's quis uh, custodia, ipsos custodes, and it translates into who watches the watchman. So as we build and as we start to create these platforms for publishing, uh, we have this power to dictate what's on them. We have the power to ban somebody and say, like with Alex Jones, he's not in the App Store, he's not in Google App Store, he's not on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, everything. He's gone. He's wiped off the web, or the, the main portions of it. But who watches that? And who gets to dictate? Who gets to say? Um, and, and, and part of this that we start running into is that with big data, there's a big responsibility that sits out there. You have a responsibility to curate and make sure that you're uh, providing a platform that's going to give um, folks the ability to speak. Um, you know, one of the beautiful things about WordPress and, and just the open web in general is that it gives a voice for the voiceless. It allows people to publish who have never had that chance before. But when you start doing that, you start doing that at scale, you have a responsibility to, to kind of monitor and, and uh, review what you're going through. And so uh, last year in The Economist, uh, they published an article, and there's been a couple of follow-ons to it. Uh, but the, their theory is, and the on, ongoing uh, discussion, is that data is the new oil. 
There's more value now in data, in the data that we're collecting in the websites that we build, um, than is in fossil fuels. And again, with that power, with that, that monetary value that's being built, there's a lot of responsibility. It's a responsibility that us as developers, we kind of like to live in this free world where it's like, nobody can tell me what to do. I'm just going to build and create, and I'm going to do what I want. And that's great. But then you launch it out, and all of a sudden you run into an issue like what happened with Strava. Now, how many people know what Strava is? Uh, a couple of hands in the room. So Strava is a fitness tracking uh, application. So you can bike, run, hike, walk, do whatever you want. It'll track it and allow you to share with others, track your times, your miles, your mileage, all sorts of stuff. Really awesome app. And so they came out with the global heat map. And they said, we've got data from millions of people across the world, and we're going to publish it out and show you where are the hot spots to go running, biking, walking. That's pretty cool. Um, here's a picture of Seattle, and, and I apologize for the, the dark screen here. Um, but it kind of shows you where the hot spots are. Where, where are people running? Where are they bike riding? You can even see, uh, you can check the slides online, you can even see the ferry lines, because that's where people are traveling on the ferries and stuff. This is some pretty cool data. Um, and so when they first published it, people started looking at it, looking around the world, and then they started looking at the Middle East, and they said, wow, there's a couple of spots there that you wouldn't expect to have spots. They're kind of out in the middle of Afghanistan, um, and they have these really interesting patterns to them. And what Strava did by accident was publish where secret bases for the military were located in Afghanistan and Pakistan and all over, because they just said, whatever data we have, we're going to publish. Now, the military personnel that were wearing their Fitbits and their Apple Watches and everything else weren't thinking about the fact that they were giving data away. But this is what happens when we go out and build really cool stuff and not think about what are we doing. So I tried, the bases aren't on there, the unknown bases aren't on there anymore. The known bases are. Um, it's actually really cool and I encourage you to go on strava.com slash heatmaps, I believe it is, the, the links in the slides. Um, and you can, it's really interactive, you can zoom around and see everything. But you can go to random parts of the world and see where are they walking in these, in these cities. And so the, the question that you have to think of is what are the unintended consequences of what I build? I'm going to go build something really cool. I'm going to go build a Strava heat map. I'm going to go build a Twitter or a Facebook or a social media platform that's going to allow anybody to publish. But what happens with that, right? Um, and collectively, um, what's really scary is that big data is starting to know more about us than we know about ourselves. Um, and one of the best anecdotes for this is um, uh, there was a father who called up his local Target and started just screaming at the manager, how dare you send my high school teenage daughter pregnancy coupons for diapers and, um, and uh, prenatal medicine? How dare you? And they said, sorry, sir, you know, this, is, this isn't intended. We're really sorry. We're really sorry. Um, the manager said, I'm going to look into it and I'll call you back in a, in a week or so. And so he called him back and said, look, I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know how this slipped through the cracks. And the dad said, no, I'm sorry. I had a talk with my daughter and come to find out she is pregnant. And so what happened was, is Target had the great idea to say, we're going to look at people that register for our, uh, our, our baby registry, our, um, yeah, baby registry. And what they did is every purchase that you made at Target, you got a customer ID, and they, that ID would track every purchase that you made with your credit cards, with uh, online, in-store, wherever. It would all go into this ID, and they would begin to track it. And they had your email address, your home address, everything, because they had your credit card address, right? Um, and so what they started doing is watching, and when somebody registered for the baby registry, they then went back six months into their purchase history and said, uh-oh, they stopped buying soaps with... Um, dyes in them, and they started buying unscented um, body lotion, and they started buying calcium, and all of these supplements that when you find out you're first pregnant, you start taking, right? And so they were able to create a matrix of about 20, 25 products that if you bought enough of these, you would have a pregnancy score, and it would trip a advertisement that got sent out. And so what ended up happening was is the daughter would go to Target, and she was buying all these things, because she knew she was pregnant. And they ended up sending the, the, um, the, 
font store. Now, I, this quote came from the Forbes article, and I think it's really interesting. It says, if we send someone a catalog and say, congratulations on your first child, um, and they've never told us they're pregnant, that's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. I would agree. Um, they actually got it down to the point where they saw that if you were buying blue or red, they would say congratulations on the baby boy or the baby girl. Um, things that you may or may not want them to know. Um, and then the, the statistician was also quoted as saying, uh, we're very conservative about our compliance with all privacy laws, and, and, but if you're following the law, you can still do things that get people queasy. Um, and that's true. And, and part of the issue is that we in the US have a very lax sense of privacy, a lax sense of privacy regulation. And so um, the article also said that quickly after these quotes were said, uh, Target pulled all communications and wouldn't let them talk to them anymore. Um, and I, I, I would be shocked if they still do this to, to this day. But this is what happens when you build something really cool. Like, hey, we can target pregnant women before they're you know, on our registry. This is a great way to get you know, new coupons and people into the store, but you're also exposing people for being pregnant when they may not want people to know that. Um, but one of the good ways that this is being used is in Facebook. Um, if you or someone you know um, starts posting, and uh, Facebook has algorithms to kind of detect a depression slide, and they can say, okay, this person is starting to slide into depression, so we're going to show them a message that says, hey, we care. Somebody cares. Here's a number to call. Go talk to somebody. And they actually have built suicide prevention into Facebook's platform because they've noticed that their platform can early detect some of these behavioral patterns. It can cause people to get attacked here. It can, it can. And so that's, again, this is the, this is the dual sidedness of, of the feature, right? Um, another feature that uh, I had some slides for, but I took them off because I was afraid we were going to go through them too quickly was um, the memories feature. It's really awesome. Every day I get a new memory. It's like, oh, that was three years ago. I can't believe that. Or I see my kid from, from two or three years ago, and they're a little baby. Um, but there was somebody that posted out there that says, I'm sick and tired of getting a memory every year of my son's suicide. I'm not a good thing to remember every year, right? I'm already going through it, and Facebook is re-traumatizing me on it. And again, it's one of these features that has the duality of it. So as we build, we have to think to ourselves, what are the unintended consequences, and how can we prevent some of that unintended consequences from occurring? And you start getting into this kind of minority report, you know, pre-crime, we can tell things are happening before they're happening. Um, and we're seeing this actually with uh, some of the genetic testing that's going on. So uh, how many folks have sent in the swabs to see what your uh, family history is and stuff? Awesome, you guys are actually part of a drug trial that you don't know you're part of. Um, and now all of your relatives, uh, if they've ever committed a crime that has DNA evidence but they don't know who it is, um, they recently in California actually caught a serial killer like 30 years after it occurred because they were able to trace the DNA to a family line of somebody who was a prime suspect and they go, huh, that's odd. The DNA that we collected at the scene matches the family line that we saw in 23andMe. Let's go get a warrant and then get that guy's DNA. Lo and behold, he was the killer. And so they're starting to actually, and they got the rights to do it, they're selling your data to uh, cancer drugs and to create genetically testing um, or genetically uh, targeted drugs for various things. Again, really cool. You've got all this data on people from all over the world. You've got DNA from everyone. Um, and you can make these medical breakthroughs. As a science nerd, that's really cool. Um, being a molecular biologist, DNA is really fun. This scares the hell out of me as a technologist because I can't control where my information is going. And so you run into the 80-20 paradox. And this gets applied in a whole bunch of different ways, right? Uh, the, the basic 80-20 paradox is 20% affects 80% of the uh, effects are caused by 20% uh, of, the, of, the, you know, of the code or whatever. Um, but there's also the 80-20 rule. And, and I, I'm guilty of this myself. When you're building a system, you say, let's make it for the 80%. Let's just make it work. There's no way it's ever going to be 100%. And I think we've all been guilty of this, right? You get a bug in, and you're like, that's in, the, that's in the sidelines. We don't need to worry about that. But then the question comes, what happens to the 20%? What happens to the 1% that are being affected by this? And it may not be a bug, it may be 
the memory of a suicidal uh, or a suicide in the family, or it may be the the pregnancy coupons. What happens to that 20% of that 1%? And are you creating a system that can cause pain? Um, this is why accessibility uh, is so critical to everything we do. Because as we build, if we don't think about the 20% or the 1%, we're building a way for people to no longer be able to use technology, no longer be able to use the web. Um, and, and we're isolating them, uh, and, and sometimes these are already minority populations. They're already disadvantaged, and you're pushing them farther away. And so technology has the power to change millions and millions of lives. And I think that's one of the fun things about WordPress. And if you're a core contributor, or you build uh, plugins or anything like this, your code, when you deliver it, is going out to millions of people. And I had my first realization of this when I was building a website that had um, a, a broad reach to it. We were getting eight to 10 million hits per month. And I had this kind of epiphany that, holy crap, like I push a wrong CSS, a line of CSS or a bug here, and eight million people are gonna see it. Like, that's a lot of people. Um, and, but at the same time, I've also been involved in some technology where we're starting to send geolocated SMS messages to people experiencing homelessness to educate them about services that are in their area that they may not know about. And that's pretty fun, because now we get to use technology to reach and impact the lives of millions. And so, growing up in a tech family, we had a little bit of tough love in our family, um, all in, um, in good humor though, but my dad always ingrained into me, ever since I was a kid, I was learning to code, um, learning to code basic at, at four or five years old, um, is that computers are only as smart as the people who program them. So that was his way of saying, it's not the computer's fault, it's yours. Uh, anytime I was like, ah, oh, stupid computer, he's like, it's not the computer, that's stupid. Um, and so because of that, it's not technology has the power to change millions of lives. We have the power to change millions of lives. And we need to take that on. And so the question is, is what are you doing to protect all of your users? What are you doing, whether it's a blog, or whether you're building massive experiences like the New York Times, what are you doing to protect and to provide for all of your users? And so this is why privacy is a community responsibility. We need to build a community around privacy. We need to build a community around accessibility. Um, now sometimes we need a little nudge to get ourselves there. And um, unfortunately for us in the US, we don't get those nudges fast enough. Uh, and so Europe enacted uh, GDPR, which we all got to go through this last spring, which was a lot of fun. Um, and we all now get to click on the, yes, I want your cookies, yes, I know your cookies, yes, I know your cookies. Um, but uh, a really good source for GDPR and privacy in general, uh, Heather Burns, she's in Scotland. Um, look her up on Twitter. She has some great, great slides uh, and presentations she's been doing recently. And what she's been talking about is the differences between the European and American views of privacy. Uh, and, it, and it boils back to just the European and American culture. Um, and I was actually having this discussion today with someone, and, and they were talking about the American view, and I hadn't even talked about this, and they almost went bullet point for bullet point down this. And the inherent sense is that as Americans, free speech is a fundamental right. Everyone gets the right to free speech. Whether you're Alex Jones, Westboro Baptist Church, or you know, the New York Times, you can say whatever you want. Um, and the data belongs to the owner, and uh, the owner of the site or the owner of the application. Um, and it's an opt-out culture, right? We're going to automatically check the box for you. And, oh, you didn't check, uncheck the box. Sorry, but we're going to use it anyways. Um, and then the other thing is we have an inherent fear of government, an inherent trust in business, right? And it goes back to our bootstrap mentality of, Everybody can build a business, anybody can be successful, so our businesses are, are what we believe in and the government is just trying to squash us. And of course, we sue first, ask questions later. So everything is just, let's just sue and figure out what the courts will say about it, right? Now in Europe, it's almost 180% opposite. Privacy is the fundamental right. Data belongs to the user, not to the application owner. It's an opt-in culture. Um, and people trust the government and fear businesses. 
And now, this isn't to say, and, and litigation is a last resort, so a lot of our American views on GDPR, we'll wait to see who gets sued first and then we'll make our decisions on how much we want to comply with it, right? Because that's our mentality. And so, um, this is, is not saying one is better than the other. This is just saying we need to know what our differences are if we're ever going to talk about an even privacy or accessibility or ethics. We need to know where we're coming from culturally. Uh, now, I come from the Drupal community originally, and I got to see this in WordPress and Drupal and how we handle some of these things, right? And so WordPress, you have privacy at the core. Uh, Drupal, we don't. We put it into contrib. Uh, I'm, I'm currently trying to change that, but um, it's not really something that's happening in core. Currently, the GDPR module in Drupal has 2,300 installs. There are millions of websites in Europe that are running Drupal, and 2,300 of them are using a standardized platform. That means that the rest of them are all just kind of doing whatever they want to do, coding their own, and hoping that it's compliant, and hoping that it's, it's safe. And so, um, because of this, and WordPress is, is very much the plug and play. You turn it on, it works. Drupal, if you've ever worked with Drupal, I love it, but it's like, oh, you need this module, and that module, and that module, and this one's an API for that one, and that one's gonna talk to this one, and this one, and this one, and then there's a, a UI that you're gonna configure a few things for, and then you're good. Um, whereas in, in WordPress, you just turn it on, and, and it works. And so knowing this, that it isn't a WordPress or a Drupal thing, it's how can we work together um, and adopt common best practices across the open web, knowing our different communities and knowing our different cultures, how can we build a sense of what is right and how can we handle privacy on the open web? Um, and when I talk about the open web, uh, again, I'm pointing you to people that are much smarter than I, so go watch these. These will um, just be, um, like, pour yourself a coffee. If you're of age, put a little bit of Bailey's in there because it's going to be a deep ride. But, um, but taking what back and from whom is a great look into the open web, the, the origins of it, what it really means to have the open web. Um, and actually, just this week, um, the World Wide Web Foundation actually just published a contract for the web of core principles that they're pushing to say the web entirety. Um, this is what will happen. Uh, and it says, the web was designed to bring people together and make knowledge freely available. Everyone has a role to play to ensure that the web serves humanity. And by committing to the following principles, governments, companies, and citizens around the world can protect the open web as a public good and a basic right for everyone. So then it goes into, this is as a government, here's what you need to do. As a company, here's what you need to do. As a citizen, here's what you need to do. Um, now there's a lot of discussion of, are these right, are these the right principles, and all that. Um, I look at it as, this is a great framework. And yes, it, it breaks it down, and, and some people say it should be everyone's responsibility, we should just put out a credo of this is what it should be. But if you think about it, government doesn't act without people. People are what power business, and business, unfortunately, at times, is what powers the government. And so we all have to have our own roles, and as long as we go back to the cultures and the communities and all the different understanding of what we do, we can influence each other to create a better web. And so, um, WordPress is actually leading this right now, because you guys have, have, have privacy in core. Joomla just got that uh, tool set in. Kudos to them. Drupal, we're on our way there. We're making it, making it happen. Um, and so what we're proposing is we're actually going to be creating an open web privacy um, working group. And this open web privacy working group is going to be able to create a set of standards that say, this is what we're going to hold our projects to. As a project, we're going to commit ourselves to certain basic, fundamental uh, principles of privacy, accessibility, um, and what will that uh, what will that entail? And then we can each respectively take those back to our projects and work on uh, whatever it is in core that we do. Um, and the beauty of this, and, and I was having a discussion earlier today about this with, with someone, and, and yes, it seems very altruistic. Like we're going to go out and conquer the open web. And, we're going to be doing everything. And then when you get into the trenches, um, it, it starts to suck. Um, but the problem is, is that without this, um, we are reactive to the communities around us rather than proactive. We're reactive to GDPR rather than having a voice into what GDPR really does. Because there are parts of the laws 
that just make no sense. And it's because you have other interests outside of our own that are able to voice them into it. And so what we're hoping to do with this is not only state what we're going to be doing as an open web, but then also have some advocacy into the decision making and the policy making that goes on around us so that we can actually take part in, in these decisions. Um, but all this work needs you because WordPress is a volunteer run organization, right? We have a lot of companies that are working in it, but even those companies volunteer time to make the core happen. Uh, people take their own time to make core happen. Uh, and so this work needs your assistance. Um, so what can you do? Um, please, 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 please get involved. Whether it's writing a blog, uh, speaking out on Twitter, or, or get into um, the coding if that's what you do. Uh, become an advocate for privacy in what you do. Become an advocate for accessibility. Um, and start to think about how you can make WordPress um, impact the world in a, in a better way. And so, uh, here's core privacy, um, Slack channel, all that good stuff. Um, there's office hours. Um, they're kind of early in the morning for us here on the, on the Pacific Coast time. But uh, you can get involved there. Um, accessibility as well um, in Slack and online. Um, get involved. And there's a lot of ways to get involved here. You don't have to be just you know, uh, a, a developer to, to get involved. And so think about the impact of your code. Think about the impact of the plugins and the websites and the applications that you're building with it and what it does. Um, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for this from, from the hardcore nerds. Yes, Ross Al is a super villain, but he actually had a really good line. Um, it says, if you become more than a man, devote yourself to an ideal, because then you can become something else entirely. So the question is, let's devote ourselves to build a better web for our future generations. We have that responsibility because we have that power. Uh, my name is Chris Teitzel from Locker. And with that, I'll take a couple of questions. I've got maybe about 10 minutes or so. Yes, um, we've got a microphone here as well. Sorry, I just threw my hand up real quick. My no, yeah. Uh, Matt. Uh, so uh, one thing, uh, thank you, first of all. It's good talking. Uh, one thing that I think about uh, in terms of those of us who build the web and things like Facebook and Twitter is that um, I believe that people build platforms and products that reflect their values and their view of the world. Mm -hmm. And I personally don't believe that we will start building appropriate um, solutions for this diverse world we live in until the teams that build these things look like the world that we're for. So can you say something about that? Um, Yes, without getting my foot too caught in my mouth. Um, I agree. Um, if, you, if you look at the communities that are building, um, they don't look like the world population. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the time they look like me, um, which is unfortunate for more than one, one way. Um, but um, it's true. And, and also what it is is that if you're building um, at a, at a for-profit company, I own a company, I own two of them, um, when we build, we're building for one thing, to grow, for profit. Um, we also have an, an altruistic side of our company in that um, our goal is to make encryption available to everybody. We want anybody to have access to it. Yes, it's a double-edged sword, but we believe that it's a fundamental right of the, the web to have that. Um, if your company's aim is to just build for profit and not build for the world at large, then I th do think you run into a lot of those issues. Um, I will give uh, the larger companies credit for some of the steps that they're starting to take. Um, do I believe that it's a little too little too late? Yes. Um, but I believe that there is some change starting to occur. I, I'm of the belief that that change is going to have to be forced upon them. So um, I'm personally starting to get involved in, in the policy around privacy um, at the federal level and, and trying to get involved there so that um, we can have a voice for our views of the web, not just the commercial views of the web. Um, and, and again, I really recommend you go back and um, watch the uh, Taking What From Whom, um, Taking Back What and, and From Whom, because it talks about that, of the open web and how it was originally fostered by Facebook and Google, and then all of a sudden it started to cannibalize into the not open web, right? So um, I hope that answers your question, but I, I do think that we're starting down that path, and I think 
we've kind of opened Pandora's box a bit and we're trying to cram everything back in. Um, but I think it's possible. And I think that um, if nothing else, if we don't, it's like global warming. If we don't do anything now, it's just going to get worse. If we don't do anything now about what we build and the privacy issues that we're running into on a daily basis, then it's just going to continue to get worse. I know ethics and, and privacy are a pretty heavy topics, so um, questions normally don't come uh, right away. Thank you. Woo.